You're listening to Bowl Game Radio with Bruce Binkowski and Mark Neville on San Diego's sports leader, the mighty 1090. Hi, this is Bruce Binkowski back on Bowl Game Radio right here on the Mighty 1090. Uh, Mark Neville has now hopped a plane. Uh, in fact, uh, he's heading to Nebraska to go uh, uh, help promote uh, the uh, Nebraska football fans to come out to San Diego for the National University Holiday Bowl. And uh, USC taking on Nebraska on December the 27th at Qualcomm Stadium. And now we're going to find out all about the Nebraska Cornhuskers and the beat writer from the Omaha World Herald, Sam McEwen. Sam, thanks for joining us on Bowl Game Radio. Uh, you bet, Bruce. All right, now let's talk. Uh, let's talk Nebraska football, and we're not going to get too detailed about all the latest happenings. But obviously, it's the story. But what do you think of, and in terms of a football team coming to a bowl game without a coach, but sort of with a coach? Do you see any change in the attitude or atmosphere for the uh, Husker fans and players as they head west? I think Husker fans will actually be more excited. Um, I, I do. I do think that there will be a sense of excitement there. Even though Mike Riley won't be coaching that game, uh, Barney Cotton is the interim head coach. Um, I think fans were prepared for um, just a change of narrative, uh, and, and and I think that included a change of coach. But I think a lot of people were prepared for for something where they can just sort of root for Nebraska without any sort of uh, you know ideology or pro bow or anti bow attached to it. So I think people are going to be excited. Uh, for the bowl game. I really do. I think you'll see a good turnout from Nebraska fans. Uh, Nebraska fans are a plenty in California and a plenty in Arizona, and I'm pretty confident uh, that, that the date of the game is, is, is just perfectly positioned. And you're going to see 10 to 15 to even 20,000 Nebraska fans hit, hitting that stadium that aren't even from Nebraska, just people driving to San Diego just to take it in. Um, especially against a team like USC. Well, and that's the thing, too. And we experienced the the famous N- Nebraska fandom uh, in 2009 and 10 uh, when they came to San Diego. But right. but there's something to be said for, forget about everything else, it's USC and Nebraska, two traditional powerhouses that have great histories. So uh, it, d- it does add a little cachet to the game on the 27th. It does. It does. Uh, it's a helmet game, right? I mean, uh, you could you could look at Nebraska's helmet, you know who it is. You could look at USC's helmet, and know who they are. Uh, it's 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 one of those kind of experiences. So great uniforms, uh, you know, great great traditions, good bands, um, you know. And and although USC has controlled this series, uh, there hasn't been that many games in it. And I got to think that that USC is going to travel really well to that site, having never been there before. And I think Nebraska players. Here's the thing. I think Nebraska players are going to be extremely excited to play USC. Um, Not that they haven't played some other good opponents, but this is probably of all the bowl games that they've had in the Bo Pelini era. I'm confident that this is the opponent that they will be most excited about in those seven years. If you just say the word USC to a Nebraska football player, they're going to nod their heads and go, yep, it's Hollywood. We know who we're playing, and we are going to be ready for it. So, this is the best bowl opponent that Nebraska's had, I'm telling you, in a really long time. Um, I think people are really excited for it. You're listening to Bowl Game Radio on the Mighty 1090. I'm Bruce Binkowski, and we're speaking with Sam McEwen, who is the Nebraska beat writer for the Omaha World Herald. All right, since this show program airs in San Diego, Southern California, I want you to talk to us a little bit about some of the star players, and let's start with the quarterback, Tommy Armstrong Jr. Give us a little take on uh, this young man. Tommy's a dual threat quarterback, uh, so he, he is a good runner. Uh, he, he's a physical runner, not really fast, but physical, um, and he throws a good deep ball. So what he does well is he runs the option, the zone read pretty well, and he throws the deep ball well, and when he has to improvise and get outside of the pocket and scramble, he can make plays. Um, within system, uh, in terms of throwing quick passes, short passes, he's not quite as effective. But uh, Tommy's a playmaker. I'm looking at the stats here. Tommy Armstrong Jr., he threw for 19 touchdowns, passed for 2,300 yards, and he's also the second leading rusher on the team with 664 yards. So you're right, he's a, he's a dual threat. Which brings me to the ground game, Amir Abdullah. Well, Amir is a great running back. 
Um, I don't hesitate to say that. USC recruited him, I think, kind of as a running back, which defensive back. Uh, Yamir's one of the greatest in Nebraska history. He got hurt uh, in early November trying to pick up a fumbled snap. And if that doesn't happen, i got to tell you, I think Amir probably gained 2,000 yards. He was wow. on the way to doing that. Wow. Um, he is a, he's, a, he's got great vision. Uh, Amir is the kind of running back that you, he will kind of stretch the play to the outside and you don't see a hole, but he does. And he kind of cuts into that hole, and he pops out the other side, and defenses have a really hard time getting a, getting a square shot on. And so plays that you don't think are going to gain that many yards tend to gain yards with Amir because he sort of slides through a hole at an angle, and it's hard to, it's hard, it's hard to tackle him. Um, he, is, he is a running back in every true sense. Like He's not one of these classic galloping guys like Buck Allen at USC. But he is a very gifted runner. He's just a hard guy to pick up. Uh, he's slippery. Sam, anybody on defense that uh, San Diego fans should be looking uh, looking at from uh, the Cornhuskers? Yeah, the big name is Randy Gregory. Uh, he's the defensive end who's a who's an NFL first round draft prospect. I, I would expect Randy to leave for the NFL draft. I think he needs to. I think he'll be a better fit in the NFL than he is in college. There are teams this year have, who have neutralized Randy. Um, you know, I, I would not. Say Randy is as good as Leonard Williams, the defensive lineman for USC. I think Leonard is better. The two best defensive players all year for Nebraska is a defensive tackle by the name of Malik Collins, uh, who is really good. Uh, he's a sophomore. Uh, he's a big dude. He's about 6'2", 305 pounds. Uh, he's a load. He can actually he can also rush the passer. And then a safety by the name of Nate Gary, who is really fast. Uh, you may not think it when you look at him. He's 6'2", and about 225. But Nate was a sprinter in high school, and he ran a 10-6, 100-meter dash. And so Nate's really fast. Uh, he had five interceptions, and he's a playmaker. And so when Cody Kessler goes back to pass, uh, they're going to try to they're going to try to test Nebraska deep as well. They should. They have a great passing game. Nate Geary can erase can erase some plays. Uh, he he may he may catch them napping a little bit. So they're going to have to be cognizant of that when they're watching film, USC players. We're speaking with uh, Sam McEwen, a Nebraska beat writer for the Omaha World Herald. And, of course, we're talking about Nebraska football as the Cornhuskers will be in San Diego on December the 27th to take on USC in the National University Holiday Bowl and go to sandiegobowlgames.com to order your tickets or go to uh, Window B at Qualcomm Stadium between the hours of 9 and 5 and get your tickets. And I'm telling you, uh, Sam, there's a lot of interest down here. Tickets are uh, uh, ticket sales are very brisk, and uh, we hope that continues. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned earlier about how um, – Nebraska is excited to play USC, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, from our standpoint, and you know, I'm the bowl director, so all along during the process, we thought that uh, this first year with our Big Ten relationship, we'd probably end up with a Minnesota or Wisconsin. And as as late as Sunday on Selection Sunday, we thought Nebraska wasn't in our picture. Then all of a sudden, things happened, and Nebraska came. Were you as surprised as we were that the, the Cornhuskers all of a sudden were heading west? Yes, I was, because I expected Michigan State to play in the Orange Bowl. Um, yep. I have to tell you that Michigan State moving up, moving down, and Mississippi State sort of magically moving up two spots, uh, even though neither team played. Uh, and Ohio State won the Big Ten Championship by 59. Alabama won the SEC Championship 42-13. to 13. It just struck me as odd that Michigan State would, would drop below Mississippi mm-hmm, State. Mm-hmm. But in Michigan State dropping below Mississippi State, every eligible Big Ten team suddenly got in a bowl. So Miss, Michigan State goes to the Cotton Bowl instead of the Orange Bowl. If Michigan State had went to the Orange Bowl, that would have nullified the Citrus Bowl and would have meant that one Big Ten team was staying home. By Mississippi State jumping Michigan State, Michigan State doesn't go to the Orange Bowl and all the Big Ten teams came to make it. So, no, I did not expect Nebraska to be eligible for the Holiday Bowl. I expected uh, the Outback Bowl to be Wisconsin and then the Holiday Bowl to be, to be Minnesota. And, or, or, and I, then I expected Nebraska to either go to the Foster Farms or the Music City, uh, depending on whether the Music City wanted Nebraska, which they got Notre Dame, so I'm sure they're happy with what they got. But, no, I expected Nebraska to be going to Santa Clara. Uh, but once that switch happened, Nebraska to the holidays seemed very likely, and it panned out, and they're getting a better opponent. Now, you know, um, Stanford's a fine team. 
and San Francisco is a fine place, but I, I think USC is a better team, quite frankly, a tougher team for Nebraska to play. Hmm. Um, but I think I think Nebraska players are more excited about USC. Oh, that's than any any team they could have faced. I, if I and we'll talk to them tomorrow and, and get that officially. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's a team they could have faced short of Alabama or, or maybe Texas that they would have been as excited about playing than USC. Uh, USC comes with a big time brand name. They got a lot of kids from Southern California on their team who are going to be excited to play that game. Kids that USC didn't offer, and a few kids like Amir that USC did offer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think there'll be a high level of excitement for that game. Yeah. And that is really good to hear. Hey, tell our listeners a little bit, since it's going to be one and done for Barney Cotton, tell us about the interim coach before the Mike Riley era uh, begins. But Barney will be the head man on the sidelines on the December the 27th. Barney Cotton is a former Nebraska offensive lineman. He then played in the NFL for a while. Um, he was a head coach at the small college level. Moved on to New Mexico State. Was the offensive coordinator in 2003. That was the same year Frank Solich was fired. He moved to Iowa State for four years, was the the coordinator there, then came back to Nebraska when Bo Pelini was hired. Uh, And he was, uh, you know, he was Bo Pelini's offensive line coach for a long time. And now he's sort of the run game coordinator, or he was. Um, Barney is is a Nebraskan, a native Nebraskan, and has head coaching experience. And, uh, you know, is. In some ways, I think Barney was helpful over the years in terms of his organizational ability and just his overall leadership. Um, you know, Barney was a little bit of a lightning rod for criticism when he was offensive line coach because the offensive line in Nebraska is sort of like a sacred property. But I always thought Barney did a good job, and uh, I think he'll do a good job of getting this team ready. Um, I think in terms of the big picture, he's probably the best guy they had. Sam McEwen covers Nebraska football for the Omaha World uh, Herald. Sam, thanks for joining us on Bowl Game Radio. Looking forward to seeing you when you come out to town uh, just a couple of weeks from now. Same here, Bruce. Take All care. right, take care. Sam McEwen, Nebraska beat writer, the Omaha World Herald. So now we have learned everything we need to know about Nebraska football. When we come back on Bowl Game Radio, we're going to talk a little bit about the pageantry. It's more than just a football game here at the National University Holiday Bowl and the San Diego County Credit Union Poinsettia Bowl. We'll be back to talk with Gary Rechtenwald, who is our band coordinator, longtime volunteer, and a a good friend of uh, all of the uh, bowl band directors or or band directors from uh, throughout the country. We'll be right back. You're listening to Bowl Game Radio on the mighty 1090. 